We're about to get started here. Hope you guys are ready for a fun morning. Thank you for being patient. We got G-Ed here. Let's make sure his mic works. Hello. So this morning, we called an audible, right? We saw you guys yesterday. We saw the fun everyone was having. We could tell they wanted a whole lot more. Um, so the goal is we're here to give you an opportunity to ask questions that you want to ask G. Edward Griffin. So the next section here for the next few hours, like, or not few hours, for the next, what, 45 minutes to an hour, we'll be spending time just giving them the opportunity to ask you questions, whatever things that they would have had from the last few years or even seeing you talk yesterday, maybe even connecting some of the dots we see happening right now. Like you mentioned a little bit about CBDCs and the idea of what you know, central bank digital currencies are gonna do. And the idea you said is control. So I have an idea that there's probably a lot of questions out here. So we're just gonna open it up to you guys, as well as those of you who are on the Zoom. So make sure that you're doing that. Derwin is watching and we'll be sending you messages to ask as well. So with that said, I'm gonna give you a second, say good morning and we'll start the questions. Okay, well, good morning. <laughs> so, first question out there, I want us to go from this side over here. So, who over here has a question for G-Ed? Not all at once. One right here, there you go. You don't have to answer this, and, and I noticed your gait pattern. I just wondered if you had been vaccinated. This may surprise you. The answer is yes, but I was about five years old. <laughs> Please don't drop the mic. Please. <laughs> Tried to stump us with a good one. That was, that was better. Who's next? In the back. We're going to walk all the way back here. Mr. Griffin, did you interview Yuri Bezmanov? Yes, I did. Thank you. Would you like to elaborate on that question? <laughs> well, on, on one of the videos, uh, you're not in the picture at all. Uh, so I just caught a glimpse of you, and it was a very long time ago. So. I figured that you had interviewed him and uh, when he did his famous interview. Uh, yes, I did interview Yuri, and uh, that's a rich topic there because there were a lot of behind the scenes uh, conversations that never were on film or on videotape that uh, if you're interested in his off the record comments that I'm sure that he doesn't mind my repeating them. Now, we could go back and talk about some of those things because there's much to learn from Yuri Bezmianov's life and his uh, unfortunate passing away. But uh, I'm thinking you may have confused that interview with one I did of, um, oh golly, the, the fellow that we named it uh, Hidden Agenda, Norman Dodd, who was the chief investigator for the Reese Committee. And uh, I was not visible in that video at all. We just had one camera. So we put it on him, and I was behind the camera asking questions. But with Yuri, I was quite uh, visible throughout it. It makes no difference who was on camera. But uh, anyway, we, those were two, two gentlemen I had a chance to, uh, to interview at great depth and got to know them pretty well, too. So um, having mentioned Yuri, I guess I just ought to plunge right ahead and tell you what was on my mind when I suggested that maybe he had some information that he shared with me that might be of great interest to you uh, that was not in the interview. The first thing that I remember that struck my curiosity was, here was a man, Yuri Bezmianov, by the way, in case, how many people have seen that interview with Yuri Bezmianov? Uh, oh, not very many, all right. Then this takes a little bit of explanation. Yuri Bezmianov, uh, was a, K, a defector from the KGB, from the Soviet Union. And uh, 
There's a lot of interesting things about that, but the most interesting to me is that, not that he was the defector, because there were several of them, I'm going to guess all together maybe about a dozen, and uh, that we knew about. Unfortunately, we didn't know about most of them, because you explained to me that you don't defect from the KGB and live. And they, they usually uh, hunted these people down no matter where they were in the world and uh, either killed them or kidnapped them and took them back to Russia where they could publicly torture them to death in, uh, in the presence of the other KGB agents. They'd call everybody together for a big meeting and say, this is what happens to you when you break your code of honor with us. And um, when I say torture them to death, one of their favorite uh, methods was to take, take the agent and throw him in, a, in an oven like they, where they cremate bodies and uh, burn them to death in the oven. And they all had to watch him burn and scream and so forth and die rather painfully. So it was a cruel, uh, a it was, it was a, a, a quick view into a cruel system that still fell apart because people like Yuri were still willing to take the, the risk and defect. The other thing about uh, Yuri's story was that he was uh, not just a KGB agent, but he came from a very high-ranking family. Um, that's in the interview because he showed pictures of his father who was a general and had been active in the early days of the Soviet Empire and he was highly respected, and it, it, it brought home to me for the first time the reality of that this so-called communist classless society had more of a class system than any capitalist system I'd ever heard about. Because if you were born into the right family, if you were the son of a military general, you had a, a palatial place to live, you had a chauffeur, a driver, you had all the food and clothing, everything you could possibly want, you didn't have to buy it because it was part of the system. And they called that a classless society. And uh, so anyway, Yuri gave up a lot when he defected from that position. Not only was he risking his life, but he was, uh, he was giving up a, a life of great luxury and, uh, and preference. And I remember asking him, I said, well, what motivated you to do that? And he took the longest time to answer. And he sort of looked into space and he said, well, it's hard to describe except, I've forgotten the exact words, but he, it was something like, I couldn't stomach it. He couldn't stand to see the injustices and the, and the cruelty and, the, and the, the high class society that he was in working against the, the, uh, the benefit of the common man. And in spite of all of his uh, background and his, his, his uh, advantages and everything and, and, and the, the threat of death and torture, he still defected from the system at great, at great uh, risk to his life. He was in India on assignment then, and he, had, he figured his best chance to get out of the system was to escape as though he were a hippie in India seeking the lifestyle of the gurus, you know? And uh, so he dressed up like a hippie. He let his hair grow very long, put a wig on actually to make the final escape. And uh, he sort of, sort of snuck into the, the large group of American and European hippies, literally, who were there uh, supposedly to get enlightenment from the gurus, but were there just to smoke hashish or, or marijuana or something like that, have a good time. and. Uh, so he had pictures of himself with the, with the various gurus, and he was there with, you know, practically naked to the waist, and they're all sitting around thinking about wise things to say. So this was, this was a real, the real man was very fascinating. And the, the other part that you might find interesting is that when he came to the United States, he thought that the FBI and the CIA and the federal government would be so happy to see him, a, a, a high-ranking KGB defector who was in charge, by the way, I forgot to tell you that, his assignment initially was to, uh, to greet all journalists from the Western world who wanted to come to Russia and see what communism was really like 
So they come and see it for themselves, and then they could report on it. And he uh, told us the story about taking a crew that came from Look Magazine from the United States. They sent over a few people, a little, I think about three or four or five, and they were going to take pictures and interview and, and see what life really was like under communism. Well, they were, there were journalists like that coming all the time to Russia from various parts of the world. And his job was to greet them at the airport, take them to their hotel, the finest hotel in Moscow, in a, in a limousine, very nice, and get them drunk as soon as possible, and uh, treat them to, to lush meals and lots of wine and vodka. And then, when they're all worn out and drunk and hung over, then, well, well, now we go look and see what Russia is really like. And they're sort of not interested in that anymore because they're, they're not feeling very well. And uh, also, they, they've made fools of themselves, and uh, they feel a little bit sheepish about being too inquisitive. And he was describing about how the psychological system worked in setting people up to now take the tour. Well, the tour was always the same. Uh, they said, well, what would you like to see? And I said, well, we want to see what life is really like. And he said, well, I understand, he would say, I understand you people um, in the Western world think that we don't have religion, we don't have marriage, we don't have, you, they think, you think our prisons are cruel and so forth. Is that what you're thinking about? Oh, yeah, that's it. Well, why don't, I'll see if I can arrange some, some churches that you can go to or some prisons. Would that be of interest to you? Well, of course, it was all set up. And, um, oh, yeah. So the first thing they do would go down to the, one of the great cathedrals in Moscow, and um, a Greek Orthodox cathedral, a Christian religious institution. Oh, you've got one here in Moscow? You've actually got a church here? Oh, well, of course. You mean they told you you didn't have that? We didn't have that here? They lied to you. Look, we'll go down. Well, they went down to the cathedral, and of course the priests are all communist agents dressed up in priest's uniform, and, uh, and they're... Um, Many of them, unfortunately, were really graduates of seminaries because that was their assignment to go in as undercover agents. And they really were, they did hold positions in some, some of those religious organizations. They were authentically ordained, but they were not authentic in, in, the, in their religious views. They were there to, to control the population by being supposedly a Christian leader when in fact they were atheists and so forth. Well, uh, all of this, I, of course, I'm learning all this for the first time, getting it from, directly from Yuri Bezmenov. And uh, so they, they go down to the church, and, and there's a wedding. Oh, look, they're having a wedding. And uh, there's the wedding party, and they've got the music there and the champagne, and there's the bride and all the guests there, and they're having a wonderful time. They're dancing and so forth. And Yuri says, they were very impressed by that. Take pictures of it. It all wound up in Look magazine and everything. See, they had religious ceremonies and weddings, and there's the priest and, and so forth. And there they're, they're kneeling at the altar. They're praying to, to God. And everything. What, who says this is a godless society? And then Yuri says, we do that every Tuesday and Thursday. <laughs> and we, he said, we've been doing this for a long, long time. And these idiots, they come along, and they really believe it. And this is the story that I got directly from Yuri Bezmenov. None of that got into the interview because it was, we just didn't have time for it. But Yuri Bezmenov was so disappointed when he came to the United States because he thought the CIA and the FBI would just welcome him, but they found him to be an embarrassment. He got in the way, and they interviewed him, and they interviewed him, and interviewed him, and they, they, they ignored him, basically. They refused to put his testimony into the, into the, uh, into the public domain. They... Uh, they put him up in a, in a room in a hotel and didn't call on him for weeks on end. And uh, finally, it was clear that they were not going to, to treat him as a, uh, as a hero or as an asset that was valuable. They just wanted him to go away. And so he more or less was sent away to go back to Canada, which is his route of entry. When he, when he snuck out of India as a hippie, he went to Canada. And then he came to the US. And this is where he was greatly disappointed to learn the truth. The truth is that the United States government was not interested in anything that would embarrass the Soviet Union. So those are little insights behind the interview with Yuri Bezmenov. And if you have a chance, please come to our website, which is redpilluniversity.org, and you can find that interview. And just uh, it'll look up the name Yuri Bezmenov, and I think the title of the interview was changed to uh, um, I was paid for deception or something like that. Uh, my job was deception. 
you're by Yuri Bezmenov, and you get that whole amazing story. So I, I didn't really answer your question. Well, I did, yes. I did the interview with <laughs> Yuri Bezmenov. That was the short answer. I just gave you the long answer. So we got another question back here. I promise this gentleman first. Thanks. Sir, I think you're amazing, uh, and I think God's used you to wake a lot of people up. You woke, you woke me up with your writings. Uh, I got to confess before my question, for many years after I heard the name of your book, I never read it because I honestly thought it was a work of just fiction. Just based on the title, The Creature, I thought it was a horror book. I, but it really woke me up. My question, it's, it's two parts. The dynastic wealth that's been inherited by the descendants of the men who founded the Fed, do you think a determined administration could bring a lawsuit to recover some of our collective wealth that they've stolen from us? That's the first question. The other is, realistically speaking, do you think a determined administration could bring the Fed down? Thank you. Well, I, I think I understood the first question pretty well. Is there any chance of uh, legally uh, re requiring these uh, people to return some of, the, some of the assets they've stolen from the public? And the second question I wasn't quite clear on. Would you repeat that again, or maybe you could? Uh, it was, do you believe that administration today could bring about the demise or, you know, destruction of the Fed? Well, okay. So the first question is answer no, and the second one is no. <laughs> now let me amplify. <laughs> so is there any chance that the present administration uh, could, uh, could do anything to change the status quo, really, is the question. Not just to get, to get rid of the Fed, but to do anything that's major or important. It's because the current administration and the one before that, I'm sorry to say, and the one before that, I'm sorry to say, and the one before that, and before that, and before that, are all part of the problem. They are it. It's not separate at all. We're looking at something which is much bigger and how most people re think of it. They think of it as, well, the Republicans or the Democrats or uh, the, uh, some group, you know, the left-wingers or right-wingers and so forth. I talked a little bit about that yesterday, but it's not. Well, it's the deep state. Well, what's the deep state? We don't know. It's, uh, the people don't know. And what it is, it's a group of, a group of uh, individuals who all believe in collectivism, and they don't care whether you call it communism or New Dealism or republicanism or Americanism. They don't care what you call it, as long as it's collectivism. And um, so when you think that there's a substantial difference from one administration to the next, it's a mistake, because that's all just for, uh, for window dressing. The people that are running the show, the ones with the hands on the levers of power, are all collectivists, not all perhaps, but uh, pretty close to it. And that applies not only to the government, but it applies to the judicial system as well. So the idea that you could take this to court and you could sue these people, it's, it means that you don't understand quite how this works, what, what the enemy is. It's not an administration. It's not a political party. It's, uh, it's none, none of those things. These people are all, they come from all different branches of these things, and they, but underneath they all believe the same thing. That's why they, that's why they work together. They may fight each other for dominance. Uh, I might just digress for a second. Uh, one of the problems that people have thinking that communism and fascism, for example, have got to be opposites. We've got the left. Communism is on the left, right? Well, fascism and Nazism is on the right, and they're opposite of each other, so pick one. Got it? That's your choice, left or right. Are you a communist or a fascist? You gotta be one, right? That's the trick in the question. No, don't pick one, neither one, they're the same. That's what I was trying to say before, they're really the same. Well, how can they be the same? Because they fought a war, they killed each other. They killed each other by tens of thousands, maybe millions of people, a war was fought between them. Well, yes, it was, but what was the war being fought over? Over a disagreement on what they believed in and their principles, their political philosophy? No, it's the same. They were fighting over territory. Who was gonna control this one world order that they like to call it? Who's going to be the top dog? That's what it's all about. And they do fight among each other for dominance, but not because they disagree with each other on, on principles. So this is a, a, a principle 
issue that people need to understand if they're going to be realistic about how, how to solve the problem. You've got to understand what the problem really is. And the problem really is not left versus right. When I first started into this, this uh, awareness years and years ago, I thought I was a right winger because I had to be. Because I didn't want to be a left winger. I knew that's what I was fighting. And what was my option? Well, okay, if, if, the, if the left is so bad and the right is the opposite, then I have to be a, a right winger, right? And I remember calling myself, well, I'm a right winger. And I had some friends who, one of them wrote a little book, you know, how to, how to support the right wing. And I thought it was a great little book because I thought it was all about fighting communism. And well, anyway, I was so stupid in those days. I just didn't understand yet. So uh, I'm perhaps over answering this question, but my short answer to both of those is no and no, and that's the reason is because the, both, both of those groups that we're talking about are really the same. They're not, uh, you're not gonna get the courts to, to uh, go against the administration or the Republicans to go against the Democrats and so forth because the ones that are really holding the power there are all of the same uh, opinion, and they, are, they really are the enemy. Thank you. I got another question online. <clears throat> this is from Mary. Mary uh, tweeted out, X'd out. In your perspective today, what do you see as the most dangerous things that we should be aware of as Americans here, living in a community, as families, fathers, mothers? We see a lot going on. What is the biggest concern to you? Is you've been able to see a lot of history in the past, what, 50 years. Things have changed so much. What do you see as one of your biggest concerns going forward here? That's a tough one because there are so many biggest concerns. Um, I think probably my biggest concern is the lack of indignation that the American people have about it. Even many of those who understand to a great degree the depth of what I've been talking about, there seems to be an apathy, uh, and now we're talking about the psychological war that's been waged against them, there seems to be an apathy because the American people have had their, their conscience anesthetized. They think there's nothing they can do about it. They don't understand it completely anyway. They look to the left, they look to the right, they look to the Republicans, they look to the Democrats for leadership, and they're betrayed by, always betrayed by no matter what. And they finally get to the point where they say, what difference does it make? I can't do anything about it. What can the average person do, you know? And so forth. And it's the apathy that really scares the heck out of me because we need that to stop. And it's not going to stop unless we can show the way that there is, there is a chance, there is something that can be done. But it's not the traditional way. It's not a simple matter of who you're gonna vote for. Americans have been conditioned to believe that their totality of, of obligation of citizenship to their country is to pick a candidate and vote for him. They think that's it. Every two or four years, they say, okay, who's running for office? So let's see, I like this guy, and what is it? And I look at the, oh, she's pretty good. And you, you, you pick candidates that have been chosen for you. You have no voice in who, how those candidates got chosen by their respective parties or whatever mechanisms they have. And this is true in labor unions and corporations and so forth. Your leaders are really not picked by you and you, you're given a list of candidates that have been chosen by little power groups within those larger organizations, and you have to choose between, like I thought I had to choose between communism and fascism, and that's not much of a choice. So um, that's what scares me the most, is that we're not moving very fast in waking up the average, the average, the, I hate to use that word, the average person, the average person wants, who wants to wake up, let's, let's narrow the field a bit. That's not the average, by the way. Average American doesn't want to know very much. But the, the one in this room, let's talk about the average in this room. This is a whole different animal here. These are people that want to do something, want to know and uh, change the system and restore what we used to have and go beyond that. So what can we do, those of us in this room, well, there's plenty we can do, but the first thing is to, is to get rid of our illusions about who we can turn to for leadership. And that's what scares me the most, is that that element of education still needs to be done. And that's the whole reason I am doing what I'm doing, is to, to bridge that, 
that chasm of understanding of who the enemy really is and how we can uh, how we can get those people out of positions of authority in our government and in our social units. It can be done, and it has to be done, I might add, in a way that surprises you, and that is that we have to do it more or less the way it was done to us, the way our enemy took away our country. We've lost our country, you know. We're not, we shouldn't be talking about how do we defend liberty and freedom. We should be talking about how do we get it back. We've lost it, ladies and gentlemen. We've lost our country. We were invaded not with soldiers with uniforms, but we were w with, invaded from inside, from within, with people who were born as American citizens, wore civilian clothes and ties and, and drive nice cars and go to church and things like that. The, people living, living next door. That's how we were invaded, because they had ideas that were different. It wasn't that, it wasn't that their nationality was different, or their race was different, or their, their religion, religion was different. It was because of their ideas about social order and political structures and so forth. So back to the question. That scares me the most, but it's kind of encouraging because it's a simple solution. If we can just get the information out with enough alacrity, enough clarity, and enough uh, determination. It doesn't take much to see through all of that, and if we can just get enough people to recognize what's really going on, and then come together and work together, because you know you can't do this alone, that's true. We're not trying to build a collective society at all, or a collective society, of course, isn't so bad. Let's take just a moment on those words, because people say sometimes, well, Griffin, you talk about collectivism being bad, and yet you want to you form a group and, and get people to work collectively, right? So how aren't you doing exactly what you're opposed to do? I said, no, 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 not quite. There's a difference to understand here, the difference between collectivism and a, collect, a collective action. Now, collectivism and collective action are about as opposite as you can possibly be, even though the main stem of the word is the same. Collective action is where you and I might want to get together and cooperate and put on a meeting like this. Nobody's forcing you to come. We say, we're going to have a meeting, we're going to have some speakers, and wouldn't you like to come and uh, see you then? I, just because I'm an individualist doesn't mean I have to move my piano alone. If I want to move my piano, I call my friends and say, hey, I, I need some help moving my piano. Would, would you like to help me come on over, come on over Saturday? Uh, we'll have some pizza and uh, have some beer if you want some, some wine, and we'll watch the football game, whatever you want to do. But We'll move my piano, too, That sounds okay? lovely. I'd love to help you with that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> pizza and piano. But we move the piano first. That's fine. Okay. As long as I get to hang out with you and have pizza, I'm good with the wine and pizza and beer. Yeah, That's yeah, good. Okay. Yeah. So you, 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 need, you need collective action. But collectivism is different. Collectivism is that I need to move, move my piano. I'm going to call the commissar. Commissar says, yeah, you move the piano. You, 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 and you show up at 9 o'clock to move the piano. Or to prison you go. Or, you know, it's, you're compelled to do it. The whole idea hinges on whether it's voluntary or with compulsion. And if you can get that clear in your mind, almost everything we disagree with between our opponents and ourselves is whether we should do it freely or under compulsion. It's as simple as that, really. The collectivist believes that if it's worth doing, it's worth forcing people to do it because they're too damn stupid to know what the right thing is, and they are smart, and they'll tell us what the right thing is, and we will do it or else. And that is the whole thing between collectivism and individualism. And it filters out into so many areas, it's, you wouldn't believe that that's really the same concept no matter where you look. Okay, that's enough. That Sounds a lot like... Uh it could be good because it sounds like marriage, right? Like my wife tells me what to do, and I don't really have a choice. So well, I think what do you that's mean you what don't you, have to. Well, I don't have a choice. I, I can do it or I can die. Oh. <laughs> there is no choice. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like my relationship at home. One more question, guys. We got one right here, front shaking his hand. I see you. I see you. I'm pleased to meet you, Mr. Griffin. This question is from 21-year-old silver experts Zane and Jethro in Kansas, who both read your book but couldn't come today to meet you. What do you believe is the ratio to physical silver and silver on paper? 
And what is your advice to young people who see the crazy in this country and who, may, who want to make a difference for the better? I understood the first question, but I didn't quite understand that second part. I didn't hear it up here quite. So the question is, what should we do? Let's, you know, there's a many of us in here right now who see the problems you're describing. Mm -hmm. What do we do? How do we bring forward this indi the individualism that you talk about? What's our solution yeah, how, how to, do we get it to doing this? Yeah. All right, thank you. I like that question. <laughs> yeah. The ratio, tell you the truth, I don't know. This is, there are plenty of people in this room that do have that answer, though. My only impression on the ratio between uh, real stock, real inventory, silver, now, I guess if we're not talking about in the ground, but in, in warehouses someplace, I, I presume that's the question. Anyway, we don't know how much silver there is because I've been learning about technology of late that uh, it sounds pretty convincing to me that silver and gold are, are one of the most, most plentiful minerals on the earth, except it's in a monatomic form, and we don't recognize it, and our instruments don't read it until you pass electrical current through it and stuff like that. But it's all over the place. We don't know what the quantity is. But anyway, if we're talking about inventories that can be used for commerce or money, uh, I'm sure that the, the amount on paper must be way out of proportion right now compared to what's actually in the vault or in the warehouses. I'm going to, uh, my number would be probably 80 to one or something in that category. But there are plenty of people in this room that have that exact number. So does anybody in the room have the, know the exact number on the ratio? How much is it? 256 to 1, says this gentleman. So it was even worse than I thought. Yeah. Now, what do we do about it? That's, I'm glad you asked that question because that's really what I, what's on my mind all the time. I mentioned before that we will, if we're going to recapture our, our liberty, and our, our privacy, we're probably going to do it exactly the way we lost it, only in reverse. And that is, we weren't conquered by guns and bayonets, we were conquered by ideas. And we, we were conquered pretty much as little kids in the classroom. I was conquered in high school and, and in college because I, I was taught collectivism, not by that name, but I remember reading books and hearing the teacher say over and over again, you know, the greater good for the greater number is, is how we should live. Democracy is what we fought wars for, to save the world for democracy. And therefore, the majority is the basis of a democracy. So we should always, always respect what the majority wants. And that sounded good to me as a student. I thought, that sounds great. And I, I bought into it completely because I had never heard any other, any other uh, explanation of how a system should work. So we've been conquered by our ideas. And so when we are confronted by something like the Great Reset, as Klaus Schwab talks about, where we, we will uh, own nothing and we will be happy. <laughs> I mean... A lot of people are buying into that because it's an idea, and if you hear it often enough and with nobody answering it and pointing out that ownership of property is not, is not something that you want to avoid, but something which you need to survive as a free person, and if you don't own property, you are property. Nobody's ever told me that in school. And uh, so if you don't hear the other ideas, you go along with it and you say, yes, yes, yes. And the first thing you know, you've lost your liberty and you, and you voted it in yourself. That's the trick. So that's how we were conquered. And it wasn't just with an idea, but they had a method of delivering ideas. And that method was to control the power centers of society. This was something that uh, was made very clear by a secret organization that you perhaps never heard of. And the reason, if it's true that you never heard of it, is because it doesn't have a name. It was decided upon formation that it would not have a name because that way people couldn't talk about it. And that was an organization that was put together by Cecil Rhodes, who was perhaps one of the wealthiest men in the world from England. He was 
perhaps the uh, most powerful and wealthiest person in South America. He had captured control of most of the mineral deposits of South, I mean, did I say South America? South Africa is what I meant to say. If I, did I say South America? Yeah, thank you. You should have jumped up and said, stop. <laughs> I do that too often. Anyway, no, it's South, South Africa. And um, when he died, he didn't leave any of his fortune to his family or anything except to um, an organization that he created. And we know a lot about that organization because his um, executor of his estate, a fellow by the name of William Stead, uh, wrote a book. I think if the title, if I remember correctly, is The Last Will and Testament of Cecil, uh, Cecil Rhodes. And it's all there. And um, this fellow, William Stead, was a part of the secret society, too, as you might guess. Um, the Rothschilds were part of that group, uh, mostly from the funding side, not from the ideological side, as far as I could tell. But we know a lot about this secret society because it was, it was a book written uh, called, um, oh golly, it's my brain. I had too much, uh, too much water this morning. <laughs> um, oh, come on now, help me out, Pat. Um, you know, I'm talking about Professor Quigley, um, who wrote the book, Tragedy and Hope, I'll get it out. Very, very well-known book. And the um, American, um, British American Establishment were two books written by Professor Qu Quigley, who was a professor at Georgetown University. And he was the professor that, according to uh, former President Clinton, had the most impact on his, Clinton's, political views. So we have a, an obscure name here, Professor Quigley, and Carol Quigley was his first name, uh, first and last name, Carol. And um, most people have never heard of the guy, and yet when um, Clinton was campaigning for the presidency, trying to get the nomination, in several of his speeches, public speeches, he mentioned Professor Quigley as uh, having a great influence on him. And now, that doesn't sound like anything unusual because quite often people remember their kindly professors and they speak kindly of them and so forth. But this is a lot different because the two books that Professor Quigley wrote were about the secret society, all about the secret society. That's where we get the information is from Professor Quigley's books, Tragedy and Hope and the Anglo-American Establishment. And uh, Quigley said, and there's a reason for all this, by the way, if I can keep on track, and I'll come back to the reason for my telling you this, is that um, Quigley wrote that uh, he was not a member of the secret society, but he had been invited to examine its private papers with the understanding that he would write the history of that secret society so it could be recorded and appreciated. It was not really meant for public consumption. It was meant for those on the inside who understood or wanted to fully understand what was going on in the world. So that was the nature of these books. So you gotta read these books is what I'm trying to tell you. To understand what's going on, you get a view from the inside. And what, what Quigley wrote was astounding. First of all, a lot of it is very hard reading. It's just a lot of dull history. But every once in a while you come across a page or half a page and there's a paragraph and you think, did he really say that? And yes, he really did say that. And here's basically what Quigley wrote. He said, the secret society was formed by Cecil Rhodes to dominate the world. And they chose to use uh, non-military methods to do so. They chose to come to power by capturing control of what they call the power centers of society. The power centers of society are things like political parties, labor unions, social clubs, things like that. Mass membership organizations are preferred because lots of people belong to it and they're kind of distant from their leaders. They don't really know much about their leaders except that they are their leaders. Like a political party, for example. You only know what they want you to know about their political leaders and uh, so forth. So he said the idea was to capture control of the power centers of society and the people, the average person in the world who's got, who's got plenty on his mind other than politics, has to work for a living, have to raise children and so forth. Uh, 
will never notice too much except that they'll just follow the advice and the leadership of these power centers of society. So with one-tenth of one percent of the population, you can hold control over the world by dominating their power centers. And that's what they did. And um, they didn't make a big deal out of it, but they made sure that they controlled the banking systems. That was the main, the main um, fiber of their control was the monetary systems. So you know all the bankers were involved right from the start, and they and, uh, quickly names them, and, uh, and so on. So now, the reason I'm mentioning that is because if you understand the mechanism by which uh, Cecil Rhodes decided to conquer the world was to do so so that the people didn't know they were being conquered. They wouldn't know that there was a great global movement going on. All they would know is little local issues and they would follow their leaders. And their leaders would be part of their movement. And that's pretty much how it is. And it was that way almost from the beginning because the earliest, earliest members of the Cecil Rhodes conspiracy as I mentioned, you got people like uh, the Rothschilds. I mean, that's, you're starting at the top with that. And then they fil it filters down to, to heads of political parties, heads of banks, heads of universities, heads of corporations, and so forth. So now, having said all of that, the question, getting back to the original question, how are we going to recover control of all of the freedoms and privileges that we have lost? Well, I shouldn't call them privileges, our rights that we have lost. And I see it as the same process, only in reverse. And there's nothing unethical about the process, as long as you're honest about it. I mean, they lied about it. They would deny to the, to the last man that, that they were trying to take over the world. But um, we don't have to lie. We don't have anything to hide. They did. But the idea of coming to authority or regaining your authority or coming to power is the, the way that Lenin liked to put it, is, uh, is clearer. We have to do it in a non-military way. If we think we're going to win this battle in the streets with guns and rifles, it's a big mistake because their weapons are so um, powerful and it's not, it's not like meeting the British at the Bridge of Concord anymore. Uh, so it has to be done in that fashion of recapturing control of the power centers of society. And you start right in your local community, and that's why we are now putting together these uh, Red Pill University campuses. We want a campus in every county, every political subdivision in the United States, and around the world. Our vision is just as big as theirs. Around the world. This is a global battle. This is an ideological battle. This isn't the United States against Russia or China. No, it's not. Now, it could be, I mean, it's, it could appear that way. There could be a hot war or something like that. But behind it all, it's not that. You find that if it should ever turn out to be that way, it's because China got the weaponry from us. And we not only sold it to them, we gave it to them so that we could have a hot war. And that would be a psychological impact to force everybody into submission without much more than one hot war. So it always comes back to psychological weapons today. And how are we gonna turn it around? We have to reverse the process. That's why I want everybody to please send in for that booklet I talked about, which was called The, Ch the Chasm. And by the way, I, I will not re forget, Pat, to mention the, the um, URL on that. For a free download of this booklet called The Chasm, the, uh, the, the URL is uh, chasm.realityzone.com, chasm realityzone.com, and you'll get this 50-page booklet on the ideology that is ours, not theirs, but ours. And once we have the ideology in place, now we talk about the structure and the mechanism of going into the power centers of society and taking them back one by one, school system by school system, sheriff's office by sheriff's office, county board of supervisors, board of education, and so forth, and build from the bottom up. That's how we take it back. It's, it's, it's not very exciting to, start to talk about it. It's not like we have a, a big war and we win the war and everything. No, this is a long, dragged-out war, and it's going to take a couple of generations. But it can be done, in my view, in about two generations if we really get humping on it now. Thank you. That's pretty good, huh? I'd say that. I was just telling him, I'd say that, that seems like the great message to finish off on because... 
to me, it's like the powerhouse, right? We have a choice. We can do something about what we're seeing. And you're right, it does start. Even I resonated so much with what you said about schools. Because as a father, uh, if you guys haven't seen my socks, my kids are on my socks. My wife sent me with two wedding rings and socks of my kids. Um, <laughs> so the funny thing, though, is when you, when you realize that my kids are so important to me, that's, there's literally nothing and not one of you guys in this room, even yourself, that I care about is opinion. My wife is the only person I care about. As long as she likes me, I can pretty much do whatever I want. So for me, it really comes down to I've found a lot of... Um, I guess, power in standing up to the school systems because I show up. I have lunch with my kids every week. There's, I think uh, this last year in elementary school, my son just went to sixth grade. Every week, I went and had lunch with them once a week. Every curriculum that they looked at, I went before the school started and read the entire curriculum. You know, these are things that we must do. Now, I don't have the luxury of making all the choices because I'm divorced and my ex makes those decisions, but... The idea of public schools today is, is so frightening. It really, truly is. My kids are coming home talking to me about things that I can barely understand, to be honest. I, I don't even have a clue what they're talking about. I have to ask my wife. And I don't use my Google search history like that. Mine is clean. Hers is the messy one. So whenever there's weird questions, it's on hers. But the reality is what we, really, I'm not, you can look at my phone. There is nothing there except for how much I love Bitcoin. That's pretty much it. So, <laughs> but with this said, I just wanted to thank you so much for coming. I know there's going to be off to, you know, later on. So for you guys who haven't, there's uh, lunch today with Jedward Griffin. There's about 50 spots left for that lunch. So if you guys want to go out with Gina and sign up, you should be able to come and be part of that lunch as well. You'll be signing some books. Um, but for now, I just want to thank you so much. And we're going to get ready for Ninja to come on stage. Okay, thank you, thank you.